Off the Hook, airing on OffTheHookSports.com. Your home for real news, real opinions, and what really matters about Tennessee athletics. The Off the Hook podcast at OffTheHookSports.com or Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or wherever you go for your favorite podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, iHeart. Like, share, follow, subscribe. Off the Hook with Dave Hooker starts now. Brought to you by Owl's Nest Barbecue and Steve Ray's Midnight Oil. This is Chalk Talk. Please click that subscribe and like button so that we can show up on your feed more often and give you news about the SEC, the balls, and beyond. Chris Landry of Landry Football joins us now. LandryFootball.com. You will know more than anybody else at your water cooler when it comes to football, if you join LandryFootball.com. And I want to tell you more about Alice Nest Barbecue, one of my favorite places. It is fantastic. But first, uh, Chris, I had this odd notion, and it was because I saw some tweet about he, oh, it's 21 days till football time. That was uh, Thursday. So it was three weeks, and he, Schuler won the number 21. So I, I had in my mind, which is scary, to write a column about the impact that he had on recruiting. Cause I think it's a little bit overlooked and you and I've talked about this. Um, the, we could debate who the better player is. Well, actually we couldn't Peyton Manning was a better player, but I thought that he Shuler at that time in the early nineties had a big impact on the, the Tennessee's program as far as other players that would, would come in. Can you kind of take me back to that point and what he meant? You actually recruited him too, which is super cool. Yeah, Bryson City, North Carolina, it was much ballyhooed and in an era where you didn't have social media and internet, you didn't even have internet back then. <laughs> uh, Al Gore hadn't invented that yet. Um, yeah, we um, it, it, he was a big time player, and you know to go in and get him it was was a big big news for Tennessee, and it was kind of. I mean, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I never really thought about that, but you have mentioned it a couple of times to me, and as, as I think about it, you put the timeline in. It wasn't like, and I don't know if this is what you're trying to say, but it wasn't like he was the guy that just brought Tennessee to prominence, but it, it was kind of at a point in time where he was a big-name guy, and I don't know that getting him led to other big-name guys or if it was just the, the point in time of which they were recruiting. They took the recruiting up to a different level. Right. And and whether it had anything to do with Shuler or not, it it they, it just they did, and it, it took Tennessee to where well, we all know at that time anybody that lived it saw it was around it, um, you know Tennessee and Florida were the two best programs in that uh, in the SEC. <clears throat> that game was the game, and it was a game in which you whoever won it was probably going to win the East and probably you know probably going to be in good shape to play for you know, in the version of the national title at that time, um, you, you know, and it, 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 it seemingly started around that time. And again, happenstance, uh, coincidence, or him having something to do with it. Don't know, but uh, it, it certainly was a, was a, the, the golden era. I always thought when I can remember vividly and it's amazing where I was when I found out that, they were going to, Johnny Majors was going to get fired. Um, and I, I actually, I literally was in South Bend, Indiana. I was uh, recruiting at, um, at Notre Dame and uh, we we're going to play Penn State that weekend. Uh, Rick Meyer and uh, was quarterback. And anyway, I just, I remember, and I remember hearing it. I can't remember if it was a Wednesday or Thursday. I remember getting it and then it just kind of came out. At that time, you read it in the paper a day or two later. And I remember thinking, you know, Phillip's going to be a really good recruiter because that's what was his strength. And uh, and then later on, seeing stuff come out to where, look, boy, uh, he did a did an outstanding job recruiting players like that. Yeah, my my contention with Heath was was this. I, I'll get to that first. I'm going to tell you about Alice Nest Barbecue right there. In beautiful Ottawa, they have all the wood chips that you could possibly need, the pellets that you could possibly need, the sauces, and the rubs. They're at Owl's Nest Barbecue, and right next door is Steve Ray's Midnight Oil. They service my car. They should service yours. My argument was this with He Shuler for a couple of reasons. One, I think the Mannings 
who eventually would commit to Tennessee, uh, Peyton, and uh, David Cutcliffe. I think they knew that Heath was a little rough around the edges. But somehow, David Cutcliffe and that staff turned him into the number three pick in the NFL draft. I also look back pre-Heath, and from a talent level standpoint, I'm not knocking Andy Kelly. I'm not knocking Pat Ryan. I know both of them personally. I like both of them. But I thought that once you got Heath and then to Peyton and then right on through to the, the Clausens and the Angels of the world, that Tennessee didn't worry about elite quarterback talent for about 20 years. And a lot of programs can't say that. Well, and being able to go and get the elite quarterback is something that's important then, and it's certainly important now. And when you get a guy, it, it like it kind of I don't know if it opens the floodgates, but because you can you can't stop. But once you do it, then okay, it's a it's a thing to do. I mean, you can look at places like Alabama, even under Saban. It was the AJ McCarron's good quarterback, you know, uh, Greg McElroy. But but when they started to get some good quarterbacks, look at what they're doing now. They're going out and getting the very best. Tennessee kind of made that move because they that wasn't the place that you said let's go get you know the, the the top quarterback in the country and Tennessee was on top of the list in fact the SEC was not a place where you'd get a lot of great quarterbacks because for most until Steve Spurrier got in it was mostly a running league it was mostly line of scrimmage league and mostly a running game league and I think that changed. And I think that, you know, Tennessee said we're going to throw. Tennessee was known, as you well know, before they had great quarterbacks. It was receiver university. I mean, it had just, I mean, just going back to Willie Gall. I mean, just go on and on and on. But you didn't have yet good quarterbacks, as you, not the good quarterbacks, as you mentioned, but not the elite ones. And I think Heath was a big time guy. And then, of course, Peyton was obviously the name and the whole package. And I, I think it did kind of open the door for, hey, look. He came, it's worked, we've done a good job, and, and I don't think we can underestimate a guy that you mentioned, David Cutcliffe. He had a lot to do with that because his ability to coach and develop quarterbacks was, a, was the big reason why Peyton went, and it may have had a lot to do with Heath going there. Um, and I think it, if I was going to say what opened the door, it probably was Cut. Cut's ability to coach – and, and teach. Uh, he's more known now, but he was very good back then. And I do know this, that when Peyton Manning was recruited, you know, you kept hearing a lot of different things. Uh, I did. That Tennessee staff and David Cutcliffe, they always, whether it was fake confidence that worked out or they knew something no one else did, they never had – they always felt like they were going to get Peyton Manning. Always. It was never like – all the stuff where I'm hearing this, they never flinched. They always thought they were getting Peyton, even when other people were wondering where he was going to go. Well, and it, it did lead to the following year, Tennessee picking up a great haul in Georgia. When you look back at Jamal Lewis, Deion Grant, and Cozy Coleman, that was the following year. So that – Let's spin it forward. So Nico's biggest impact uh, out of California, will it occur in the 2023 class <coughs> or will it occur after he's taken some snaps and people see what he's all about for 2024? What What is the timeline? Because now we're in this new screwy, you know, it's a wild recruiting calendar. Um, it's totally different. When do you think he has his biggest impact? Well, I think probably the second year. I, I do think in recruiting it could have an impact because of the style of offense, even with the Hendon Hooker's development. I think that they have a chance to go get a really good quarterback every year, and you have to because you don't know who's going to stay. Yeah. And so you better be prepared. And I know you can you get caught and you go find one too, but I think you have to do that. But let me just say this too because you just mentioned something, and this is taking nothing away from what the staff did at Tennessee, but you just mentioned he went into Georgia and got him. You could do that back then. Well, you could. Georgia was an underachieving program, and and it was Tennessee and Florida because Tennessee and Florida were doing a good job. Florida was better, no doubt, but Tennessee was – Georgia has been an underachieving program. They're not now. So, I mean, 
you could do the best job you can at Tennessee. You could put the best efforts of Tennessee over the past 30 years. You're not going into Georgia and getting three or four of the top best players out of the state of Georgia away from Georgia unless Georgia doesn't want them. Sure. I mean, you just, it's just not. So a lot of it, the success, people look at the results. You got to study the process because the process leads to the result. You know, is one thing to people just say, well, how many games you're going to win? All right. You can be an eight win team, you know, and win 10 games. You can be a 10 win team and win eight games. What I mean by that is it's all relative to who you're doing it against, who you're playing on the field on Saturdays and who you're recruiting against. And so right now, George is just that far ahead. And I'm not talking about on a given day, you know, for all I know, Tennessee may beat Georgia this year in a given game. We don't know what's going to happen, but I'm very confident in saying that you're not going to win the East over Georgia because I think Georgia is that far ahead. They've got such a big margin for error that others don't, that that's why they built a program at an elite level. Uh, They probably are there's probably greater separation between Georgia and the rest of the East than there is in Alabama, and the rest of the West, because you just, you've not really seen it. Uh, exception until Kirby's once Kirby's got it going along, there, there's nobody that's a real contender. Now we'll say that Florida has been screwing around and messing up and Tennessee's screwed around and messed up. So Georgia's developed that, but you know what? That's the same thing that Florida state fans say about Clemson. Oh, Clemson's good because we're not good. Yeah, and they have a distance in themselves to where even when they're not as good as they can be on a given year, they're still far better than you. So that's going to be interesting to see. So the impact in recruiting, can you chip away? Can you have bigger? So because Nico's recruitment, can that get better place? You get closer to where maybe in a couple of years from now, we're talking about the gap closing to where we're not talking about as big of an upset to maybe compete or win the East is I think it is now. I, I mean, we don't know the answer to that, but I think the impact's going to start to happen in recruiting, but it goes along with the play on the field. Quarterback play, the offense still productive. That's going to attract a lot. I'm really impressed with what they've done on defense, and I'm curious to see if they can go get the great defensive lineman and offensive lineman. Dave, quarterbacks are the most important, but the SEC is still a line of scrimmage league. And if you're not recruiting like Alabama and Georgia, you're not going to beat them. Maybe in a given Saturday you can beat them. You're not going to beat them in the standing. So that's the key. It's coaching. It's development. But it starts with players. It ends with players. And in the middle is important. But you better do that. If not, you better be comfortable with winning eight, nine, maybe an occasional 10 games. But 11 or 12 ain't going to happen unless you're recruiting at the same level. Because the teams that do that, they do that for a reason. Because they're on a different level recruiting and a different level developing. Call Steve if your automobile needs some work. Steve Ray's Midnight Oil Tire and Lube. And I tell you what, they're a Michelin distributor, so you can have the finest, smoothest ride on the road. Also, Alcance Barbecue has the wood chips, has... Everything you need, including the pellets, the sauce, and the rubs there at Al's Nest Barbecue. And great grills as well. For Chris Landry at LandryFootball.com, I'm Dave Hooker. Chuck Talk, a production of Off the Hook Sports.